It was back at the turn of the millennium when Stephen Wick, the president of White Wolf Publishing, rented a bar and invited entire staff for a day of brainstorming. White Wolf had had some hard times and they needed new ideas for games. With anime becoming more popular in the West around this time, Stephen Wick wanted to capitalize on that popularity by adding an anime feel to the game. They also wanted to make a fantasy game. Rich Thomas, the VP of production and design at the time, had learned from experience that you needed a strong theme before he started putting design teams together, otherwise you'd have a lot of wasted work. He called in the artists Joshua Gabriel Timbrook and Jeff Holt. He had worked with Josh since early White Wolf days and Jeff had helped conceptualize the original Trinity. They agreed that they wanted the game to have some kind of connection to World of Darkness while still being its own thing. Josh and Jeff were also anime fans, so they went along with Stephen Wick's anime style concept. Rob Hatch, who had worked on Aberrant, was brought in as developer. They spent a year and a half putting together sketches and trying to give the concept a visual form before sending out an art bible to freelance illustrators. During this year and a half, ideas were drawn and discarded, and there were iterations of the game that were far removed from what would eventually become Exalted. White Wolf also had to delay production, both because they didn't want to compete with the new third edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and because the developer Rob Hatch left White Wolf. A new developer had to be brought in to take over the half-finished manuscript. This new developer was Jeff Grabowski. Grabowski was already familiar with Exalted since he had been involved as a writer, having been hired to write half the setting chapter. After he took over the role as developer, he sat on an incomplete manuscript where much contested his own vision of the game. He set out to make a new and clear roadmap for the product, but there were issues with system design. They brought in waves of playtesters every two or three weeks, many of which were burnt out due to the heavy revisions and multiple iterations of the mechanics. The editing process for the first edition of Exalted was also a headache. They hired John Chambers, who was a very technical editor, but Grabowski made heavy revisions to the game throughout the editing phase. John had to adapt to every change. On top of that, Stephen Wick came up with the idea of giving charms flower names to make them more colorful, so these new name changes had to happen concurrently with the editing. It took seven months to turn the project from a fragmentary draft to a polished manuscript ready for layout. Grabowski designed the game, wrote over 120,000 words for it, supervised its playtesting, and helped shepherd it through editing. He started with Rob Hatch's background work, Jeff and Josh's concept sketches, and the advice of people like Rich Thomas, Stephen Wick, and Ken Cliff. Then, in 2001, the first edition of Exalted was published. Exalted was always meant to be a game of powerful mythic heroes, with the anime theme inspiring over-the-top action. But the developers also wanted to subvert expectations and contest traditional Western fantasy without making the game out to be an Oriental Eastern Asian fantasy. You play as one of the Exalted, like Hercules, someone granted power by the gods. In the original draft of the first edition manuscript you could play all the different Exalted, but there wasn't much difference between them. Grabowski didn't like this, since it felt more like a fantasy superhero game. He wanted a broad, focused presentation of each Exalt type, and he decided on making Solars the focus of the core book. The Solars were the most directly accessible Exalt type, the epic heroes. They were also the linchpin of the setting itself, the golden heroes returned to change the world. Grabowski knew that if he left the Solars for later, they would either become a footnote or they wouldn't be able to live up to the hype. By introducing them first, they could lay the foundation for the entire structure and set the upper bar for the game's mechanics. Grabowski was a big history buff, and he wanted to dig into historical and cultural inspirations that would make the world seem realistic, while at the same time fantastical. When conceptualizing the realm, he wanted to blend the East and Asian feel, inspired by the anime sources such as Nania Scroll, while depicting the First Age as huge and monolithic. The realm was meant to combine these themes to highlight the over-the-top anime feel with the decadence and rigid structures of Imperial Rome, as well as the huge and ornate First Age world. He also aimed to portray the realm as politically sophisticated and realistic, and something that would be more familiar to Western readers, so it took a lot of inspiration from the 19th century British Empire and the Satrapy system of the Persian Empire. 
The fact that Grabowski was such a history buff gave him a good understanding of the nuances of culture, and it was much thanks to this that creation would become as diverse as it is. The game's developers and many of its writers of the years have fortunately adopted this trait, and they enjoy digging into niche cultural inspirations while still keeping things fresh. If you've been around an exalted dev team for a while, you come to recognize that they have a specific jargon where they name drop niche cultural and historical references in a way that's almost pretentious. But I suppose it's helped them create one of the most fascinating settings in fantasy. White Wolf was most known for the World of Darkness games, and these games were known for having an evolving meta plot dominated by important NPCs. White Wolf recognized the popularity of World of Darkness and wanted to present Exalted in a way that tied the games together. They would later take a step back from this tie-in and instead argue that players could decide for themselves how connected the games would be. The meta plot was something they wanted for Exalted as well, but they recognized that they would have to take a step back on how they presented it. The PCs were supposed to be these grand heroes who would shape the world. They couldn't be allowed to become mere footnotes in a meta plot steered by major NPCs. NPCs were introduced in chapter fiction and as signature characters, but never in a way that overshadowed the PCs. This would be a later misstep during second edition with the return of the Scarlet Empress. Instead of adding a bunch of major NPCs to Exalted's meta plot, Grabowski wanted to introduce signature NPCs whose aim wasn't to shape the world but to act as conceptual representatives of exalted characters, but also as examples of how common fantasy expectations could be subverted. The first and second editions have the same five solar signature characters. The concept behind Days, the Dawncast, was to show how someone old could find new life through their exaltation. He was the experienced mercenary captain who reached a new prime, but also someone who older players could relate to. Panther, the Zenith cast, was designed to subvert the idea of priests as frail. Grabowski also wanted to portray the unconquered sun as more like the early Hebrew concepts of God, where violence could be a natural tool in the pursuit of righteousness. Ariana, the Twilight cast, was designed to be the opposite of the stereotypical wizard that was an old and frail man. Grabowski had also decided early that he wanted to highlight the game's diverse nature and difference from stereotypical western fantasy by having its leading signature character being a black woman. This was Harmonious Jade, the Night Coast. Finally, Swan, the Eclipse Coast, was designed to be subtle and to solve problems using his brain first and fist second. It was designed to represent someone idealistic and youthful. While this all sounds well and good, there were some misses in practice. First, White Wolf wanted to attract the D&D audience and made a marketing ploy where they offered people to exchange their D&D sourcebooks for free copies of Exalted alongside diplomas congratulating them for graduating into a supposedly more mature fantasy RPG. And despite wanting to subvert the typical fantasy stereotypes, first edition had a lot of suggestive art and a lot of descriptor of women NPCs as young and beautiful, something that was common in all western fantasy and therefore hardly subverted. Second edition was even worse at this, appearing outright horny in places. Before we go any further into this video, I want to let you all know that I recently dropped the community content for Exalted 3rd edition on the Storyteller's Vault. Ghost has rules for playing ghosts, including Death Lords, as well as new merits and over 200 Arkanoi on 76 pages. Even if you're not interested in playing ghosts, there are 94 Arkanoi with Eclipse keyword that you can use for your solar character. Also, I want to mention Ennefail's beautiful custom-made D10s that you can get over on her shop. I have a link in the description below for how you can get those dice in a way that also helps me out a bit. What better way to try out your new ghost characters than with some new dice, right? Anyway, promotion over. Exalted 1st Edition ran from 2001 to 2005. In these four years, White Wolf released 37 publications for the game. In 2001 they released Exalted Limited Edition, which included a core rulebook, a making of booklet, and a CD with a limited character generator. They also released the core rulebook itself, the Exalted Storyteller's Companion, the supplement book Scavenger Sons and the Book of Three Circles, as well as cast book Dawn. The making of booklet is the source of much of the information I introduced on the history behind first edition, but it also goes into more details on conceptualizing the game's art and visual style. 
The Storyteller's Companion introduced an FAQ to clarify things from the core book, as well as additional information and generic charm designs for the Exol types not in the core book. Scavenger Sons was the first setting book, detailing much of the threshold, and a book that is still relevant and recommended today, several editions later. The Book of Three Circles elaborated on sorcery and artifice, with new spells and magic items, including details on manses, domains, hearthstones, and even war striders. The cast books were meant to expand upon the associated solar costs by introducing the narrative perspectives of NPCs belonging to that cast. In 2002, they released adventure book Time of Tumult, the cast book Zenith, Twilight and Night, the splat books for Dragonblooded and Lunars, and the supplement book Savage Seas and Games of Divinity. Time of Tumult contained four adventures, most notably the Invisible Fortress, but it also introduced the concept of Alchemical Exalted. Savage Seas isn't as recommended today as Scavenger Sons is, but it's a strong supplement with guidelines on seafaring adventures. Games of Divinity detailed gods, elementals and demons in greater detail, and had several stat blocks for god, elemental and demon NPCs. In 2003, they released the supplement books Creatures of the Wild, Ruins of Rathas, Manacle and Coin, and Kingdom of Holta. They completed the Solar cast books with cast book Eclipse, and started on the Dragonblooded Aspect books with Aspect book Air. They also released the Splat books for Abyssals and Siderials. Finally, there was a free introductory adventure released called The Tomb of Five Corners. Creatures of the Wild acted as a bestiary covering all elemental directions and the scavenger lands. Ruins of Rathes covered the city of Rathes and the history of the Dragon Kings. Manacle and Coin detailed creation's economy and the guild. Kingdom of Holta was a setting book for the Kingdom of Holta. In 2004, they released the supplement books The Outcast, Blood and Salt, Savant and Sorcerer, and Houses of the Bullgod. They also released the Player's Guide, the aspect books for Earth and Fire, as well as the Firefolk. The Outcast expanded upon Dragonblooded lore with information about Dragonblooded outside of the realm. Blood and Salt expanded upon what was covered in Savage Seas by introducing Anteng and the Linta. Savant and Sorcery elaborated on magic and artifice as a complement to the Book of Three Circles. The Firefolk acted as a splat book for playing as one of the Firefolk. Finally, in 2005, they released the supplement books The Book of Bone and Ebony, Cult of the Illuminated, and Bastions of the North. They also released the final aspect books for Water and Wood, as well as the splat book The Autotonians, which had rules for playing Alchemical Exalted. The Book of Bone and Ebony detailed necromancy and had some information about the underworld, such as the city of Stygia. Cult of the Illuminated detailed the Sidereal Gold Faction and their organization, the Cult of the Illuminated. Bastions of the North detailed the Northern Direction with information on cities like Whitewall and the Haslante League. So, in just four years, Exalted First Edition introduced the foundation for what would become decades of worldbuilding. But it was a strong foundation that, to a large degree, is relevant even in later editions. First edition had a clear theme that was lost during second edition. Or rather, it wasn't a clear-cut change from one edition to another, but a gradual change over first edition's development. The game started out grittier and more mythic, but gradually shifted in tone until it eventually became many different things. First edition was far from a perfect game. And there are parts of it that suffer from the edgier writing style of later 90s and early 2000s World of Darkness writing. The good parts are good, like how Scavenger Sons is still highlighted as a strong source book today, 22 years later. But the bad parts are very bad, like the description of Sunnis Ambar in Aspect Book Wood. When it comes to Exalted 2nd Edition, you usually must divide it into two parts, 2.0 and 2.5. It was an edition that improved upon and streamlined many of 1st Edition's mechanics, but that was later heavily revised by errata and community content. Ultimately, 2.5 became a very different experience from 2.0, but it's also an edition that still has a large player base today. 2nd Edition is also arguably the most divisive edition of Exalted for several reasons. It didn't start out that way though, as it initially presented itself as a cleaner and more mechanically robust system than 1st edition. It was a prettier book by far, with improved art quality and added color. It did take a huge step towards emphasizing the anime inspirations behind the game, since it replaced the chapter fiction of 1st edition with illustrated manga-style comics, 
this choice was critiqued by a large portion of the community since the game became the anime game and many forgot about the mythic pulp fantasy theme that was important during early first edition. This was further emphasized in the edition's art. While higher quality than first edition, there was a lot of hypersexualization with scantily clad characters, if they were clad at all. This was hardly exclusive to Exalted at the time, but it was somewhat exaggerated in Exalted, as it was aimed to be both the anime game and an adult game. In some respects, it failed to be a mature game. Also, because it was now the anime game and no longer the pulp fantasy game, that was arguably one of the reasons for why the setting itself began to deviate in tone and presentation. Jeff Grabowski also stepped away from Exalted in 2006 and only returned later to consult on 3rd edition, but another argument why 2nd edition deviated in tone could probably be explained by his departure. John Chambers, the editor for first edition, took over the role as leading developer for most of second edition. Exalted second edition is more critiqued in hindsight than it was at the time though, with a few exceptions. The community was strong and active throughout most of the editions run and many created homebrew content for the game that was shared on community forums, myself included. The active fanbase and the spread of homebrew content was likely a large reason for why the game became as heavily revised as it was and why 2.5 became necessary. A lot of popular homebrew, like the crafting and mutation rules developed by Revlid, became go-to house rules for many of those who were active online, and several of these content creators, such as Plague of Hats, Revlid, and even myself later during 3rd edition, became freelancers for the official line. Second edition came at the right time for community growth, since it was active during the early days of social media, and when more and more people were online. Had first edition been produced a few years later, this would have happened earlier to a larger degree, but it was during second edition when those who developed the game became more intermingled with the fans of the game, and more fans of the game became part of the development team. Exalted second edition ended up running from 2006 to 2012, and it published 51 publications in total, though 17 of these were only digital. In 2006, they published the second edition Quick Start Return to the Tomb of Five Corners, the second edition core book, a storyteller's companion, as well as several supplement books that were now categorized as the Books of Sorcery, the Compass of Terrestrial Directions, the Compass of Celestial Directions, and the Manual of Exalted Power. These categories were meant to clearly define the type of source book it was, with the first book of sorcery being called Wonders of the Lost Age and covered artifacts and war striders. The first compass of terrestrial directions was the scavenger lands, and the first compass of celestial directions was the blessed isle. The first manual of exalted power was the splat book for the dragonblooded. This year also saw the release of the scroll of the monk, a book about martial arts. In 2007, they published the second, third, and fourth books of a sorcery called White and Black Treatises, Odinal's Codex, and the Rolls of Glorious Divinity 1, Gods and Elementals. White and Black Treatises was an interesting book, since it was printed both from the front and from the back, introducing sorcery when you read it from the front, and necromancy when you read it upside down from the back. Odinal's Codex elaborated on rules for creating artifacts and manses, but also expanded upon thaumaturgy. Finally, the Rolls of Glorious Divinity was meant to be a subcategory to the Books of Sorcery that elaborated on terrestrial gods and elementals. The same year also saw the release of the second Compass of Celestial Directions for the Wild, as well as the second and third Manual of Exalted Power for Lunars and Siderials, respectively. In 2008, they published the final Book of Sorcery, the Rolls of Glorious Divinity 2, Ghosts and Demons, they also published a third and fourth compass of celestial directions for Yushan and the Underworld, as well as the fourth manual of exalted power which introduced the Abyssals. Another book that was released this year that was like a manual of exalted power was Graceful Wicked Masks, which had rules for playing Fairfolk. Another source book released this year was Scroll of Kings, which was dedicated to mortals but also had rules that expanded mass combat and naval combat. Finally, they published a box set called Dreams of the First Age, which included the books Lands of Creation and Lords of Creation, a pamphlet called A Guide to Meru, and a fancy cloth map of First Age Creation. This year also saw a digital-only release, the Adventure Module Daughter of Nexus.
In 2009, they released the third, fourth, and fifth Compass of Terrestrial Directions, covering the East, the South, and the North. The source books Scroll of Fallen Races and Scroll of Heroes elaborated on Mountain Folk and Dragon Kings, as well as Mortals, God Blooded, and the Broken Merits and Flaw system. The Art of Exalted Companion was released this year as well, but most noteworthy were the controversial Manual of Exalted Power for the Infernals, as well as the Compass of Celestial Directions for Malphias. It's usually these two books that are referenced when talking about the controversies of 2nd edition, and for good reason that I will cover in more detail in the next video. Finally, 2009 also saw the release of the final Manual of Exalted Power for the Alchemicals. There were also several digital releases this year, such as the Adventure of the Season of the Evil Conscience, the Three Glories of the Most High books for the Unconquered Sun, Loon and the Maidens of Destiny, and, of course, the pornographic Exalted Scroll of Soul of Darkness, which was released as an April Fool's joke. 2010 was the final year for printed releases, with Scroll of Exalts that covered major NPCs and signature characters, and finally the adventures meant to provide the climax for Exalted's metaplot, Under the Rose and Return of the Scarlet Empress. The latter was a highly criticized scenario book, not as much for its content as a scenario, but for the introduced metaplot. One of the criticisms of 2nd edition was that it had forgotten 1st edition's focus on the PCs as major characters, and had them overshadowed by the reclamation of the Joses through the return of the Scarlet Empress. It's a bit more nuanced than this, and worthy of discussion, but I'm going to hold off on that discussion until the next part of this video series, where I cover these things in more detail. Even though 2nd edition saw no more printed releases, it still had several more publications. 2010 also saw the release of Splinters of the Wild, a compilation of material originally meant for the Wild Book, the Thousand Correct Actions of the Upright Soldier, which gave more Dragonblood content, Debris from the Fallen Races, which compiled material cut from Scroll of Fallen Races, the Broken Winged Crane, which added more material for Infernals, as well as the Adventure Contagion of Law. There had been changes to the core game through a scroll of errata throughout the edition's run, but 2010 also saw the developers at the time compiling articles and additional game changes in a document called Inkmonkeys. It was the scroll of errata alongside the changes presented in Inkmonkeys that laid the foundation for Exalted 2.5. Basically a revised second edition that changed many of the core mechanics and tackled some of the game's limitations. However, articles introduced through Inkmonkeys further deviated the game from 1st edition's mythic tone and helped highlight the Joses as the main antagonists in the game's metaplot. While the additions made the game a more solid game, many agreed, the developers included, that 2nd edition had deviated too far from its source. 2nd edition wasn't done yet, but the 3rd edition was greenlit and work started to happen behind the scenes. In 2011, the final Compass of Celestial Directions for Autotonia was published as a digital release, as well as an adventure module called In Hunting a Monster. Finally, 2012 saw the release of Masters of Jade and Shards of the Exalted Dream. The developers had already announced that they were working on the 3rd edition at this time, and they presented Masters of Jade as a book that would be more in line with the vision going forward. They also teased one of the new Exalt types, the Liminal Exalted, in this book. Shards of Exalted Dream detailed four alternative settings for the game. Two sci-fi settings, a modern age setting, and a kung fu focus setting. Exalted 3rd Edition had a very successful Kickstarter in 2013 that had 4,368 backers and raked in 684,755 US dollars. There was without a doubt a lot of passion going into 3rd Edition, and hype had been built up in the community since it was announced in 2012. The developers made promises of taking back Exalted to its mythic roots, and Jeff Grabowski returned as a consultant. The hypersexualization of 2nd edition would be addressed, the tonal shift towards anime style Magitech would be changed to feel more like 1st edition, many of the controversial subject matters, like the ones introduced in Infernals, would be walked back entirely, and the meta plot surrounding the reclamation would be removed to emphasize the player characters once more. In fact, the term primordials wouldn't be used at all to truly emphasize this point. There would also be new types of Exalted added to the game, but the developers wouldn't reveal these for years, only dropping hints and continuing to build hype. Exalted had also proven to be a game with a large LGBTQ audience, but 2nd edition hadn't really been inclusive in that regard. 
So, third edition took a deliberate step to include and represent LGBTQ characters, even choosing to feature a trans man on the cover. Finally, the game mechanics were also overhauled with promises of streamlined gameplay and being easier for new players. The developer proudly stated that the new edition wouldn't need an errata and that it wouldn't turn into second edition with its hundreds of pages of revisions. In reality, the new mechanics hadn't been tested for longity, and one of the main arguments against third edition is that it's the edition that is the most difficult for new players to get into. The developers also chose not to add the storytelling chapter further alienating new players. In other words, 3rd edition was all about grand promises and building hype, but as things were delayed, hype died down and animosity grew. The Kickstarter campaign had been very successful, but it was also very criticized. What was arguably the biggest mistake was that the stretch goals added content to the core book itself, which meant that the more successful the Kickstarter became, the longer it would take to complete the final product. Future Kickstarters would learn from this and make sure to collect stretch goals into supplementary books to not impact the main product. There were also other delays affecting the core book, and the community directed a lot of animosity both towards Onyx Path and the developers before the game was officially released in 2016. There would also be several leaks along the way and other controversies that impacted the line. Once the core book was finally ready to be revealed to the backers, much of the art wasn't up to par with expectations, and there were accusations of plagiarism. Some of the art had been changed or revised in a way that was rather hastily done. To understand why 3rd edition was far from smooth sailing, we must talk about Onyx Path Publishing. White Wolf, who owned the license for Exalted, had merged with Icelandic CCP Games, known for EVE Online, back in 2006. The two collaborated on an MMO for World of Darkness before its cancellation in 2014 after nine years of development. In 2012, which was also the final year we saw the second edition publications, White Wolf and CCP announced that they would no longer produce tabletop RPGs. Remember Rich Thomas, who I mentioned way back in the beginning of the video? He was creative director of White Wolf at the time and founded a new company, Onyx Path Publishing. He bought the licenses for Trinity and Sion while becoming a licensee for World of Darkness and Exalted. This meant that Onyx Path could produce games for both World of Darkness and Exalted, but they didn't own the rights to the games, and everything had to go through an approval process at CCP. But Onyx Path was also a new and small company, which meant that production times would halt or crawl. It was simply not possible for Onyx Path to produce several Exalted books a year like White Wolf had previously done. There would be plenty of corporate issues during the development of 3rd edition, and there were also plenty of controversies, delays and falling outs. Even though the lead developers of 3rd edition weren't solely responsible for much of the things that went wrong, they were hardly any angels, and they were turned into scapegoats and fired years into production. Naturally, this caused a lot of bitterness, pointing of fingers, and online drama. In my experience, nothing is clear-cut, and internet arguments are always black and white and without nuance, so I'm not going to address these controversies other than at surface level. Neither do I want to direct blame towards any single individual, since I don't have all the facts. I've seen people both point fingers at Rich Thomas, at the developers who were let go, and at others who were either part of Onyx Path or tangentially related to them. I certainly have my opinions about individuals and events, both as a fan and as a former freelancer, but I won't take part in any reactionary aggression towards anyone. The controversies surrounding Onyx Path at the time of Exalted 3rd Edition's release surely impacted sales. But it was still a very successful game and continued to be so to this day. It was harmed by the delays though, and that people had to wait for four years from the initial announcement to the release of the core book, and then wait another three years before the first Blood book for Dragonblood was released. Books that were promised early in development were scrapped entirely, like the titles Different Skies, Paths of Bridget, Towers of the Mighty and War in Heaven. It has now been seven years since the release of the core book, longer than the entire run for either first or second edition, and many are still bitter about this today. Since the core book, we saw Arms of the Chosen in 2017, What Fire Has Wrought on the Realm in 2019, Fangs of the Gate in 2020, 
and heirs to the Shogun not as well as Hundred Devils Night Parade in 2021. We had no major release in 2022, but recently got Adversaries of the Righteous, now in 2023. It's important to point out that Henry Devil's Night Parade and Adversaries of the Righteous started out as monthly releases between 2017 and 2019 before being compiled and released as supplement books. There have also been Kickstarters for Out of the Ashes, the Exigent book, and Sharting Fate's Course, the Sidereal book, which makes the manuscripts for those books available to backers. There are books in the pipeline that are still unreleased as well, such as Across the Eight Directions, Manifest Strangers and Crucible of Legends. There is no secret that the production is much slower than it was before, and I've gone into a few of the reasons why, with Onyx Path being a smaller publisher, the CCP approval process and later the Paradox approval process, since they are now the ones who own the license. But the Onyx Path also learned a lot from the controversies surrounding the 3rd edition core book, and every publication since have been largely celebrated for great content and quality. I personally find 3rd edition to be the best exalted edition there is, despite its many flaws, because the actual improvements are mostly solid. There are issues with mechanics in Charm Bloat, especially in the core book, but the world building has never been better and creation is a much more interesting and compelling place to run games in now than it was before. In the upcoming parts of this video series I'm going to detail both the pros and the cons of all editions. One of the main things that 3rd edition is criticized for today, apart from its release schedule, are the flaws that have been discovered in its mechanics and how its crunch in nature is an obstacle for new players. In the recent decade, much of RPG game design have shifted towards a more narrative and less crunchy structure. There were plenty of popular Roots Light games on the market even further back than a decade ago, but the narrative focus has become more mainstream than it used to be. This has meant that many of the mechanics the 3rd edition was initially celebrated for are now seen in poor light, and requests for a more streamlined experience grew in popularity. This is where Exalted Essence comes in. While 3rd edition still has a loyal community, it isn't growing like it did before, and much of that is blamed on its crunchy nature. Essence was meant to be released concurrently with 3rd edition, attract new players who were looking for a more streamlined experience, or have older players return and may have left 3rd edition for different reasons. But it wasn't meant to overtake 3rd edition. Most people agree that an entirely new edition, a 4th edition, before a 3rd edition is complete would most likely kill the game instead of restoring it. People have been waiting years to see their favorite splats come to life, and a new 4th edition would just make that wait longer. Essence wanted to remove the wait entirely. Back in 1st edition, Grabowski's initial vision for the game was to introduce one Exalt type at a time so that they could all get the proper treatment they deserved. But the time of 1st edition was a very different time within the role-playing scene. Essence decided to not only introduce all splats in one book, but add the new ones that had been promised with 3rd edition. This ended up being a very popular decision since many players gravitated towards Essence so that they could finally play what would feel like a complete game. However, many forget that Essence is supposed to be concurrent with 3rd edition. The reason why it doesn't put every Exile type on a pedestal is because they will get their proper care in 3rd edition. The gamble here is to risk having all Exile types feel generic when presented as part of the same book and hope that players will invest in 3rd edition to expand upon the setting. The goal was never to have Essence replace 3rd edition, though many speculated that it would inevitably do so. Unfortunately, I don't have any numbers on how many new players have come to Exalted through Essence, but I hope that it has helped bring new life into 3rd edition, rather than to divide the community even more. Essence still hasn't been officially released, so we cannot really talk about sales outside of its Kickstarter, but if we look at Kickstarter backers only, Essence had 4086, almost as many as the 3rd edition core book while Siderials, the latest 3rd edition Kickstarter, had 2334. This could be explained by the fact that core books generally do better than supplementary books, but it could also be explained by the fact that many had hopes for a revised 3rd edition, even if a true revised edition will never be made. 
I would personally love to see a new revised 3rd edition core book where many of the core issues are resolved, the solar charms are more streamlined, and the storyteller chapter is added, but I don't see this realistically happening. I did mention before that some players never transition from 2.5 to 3rd edition. Much of this is because of the completeness of 2.5 compared to the slow crawl of 3rd edition. Essence has provided a more complete picture when it comes to playable exile types, but 3rd edition is still incomplete in its world building. And Exalted's world building is the subject for the next video in the series. If you watched this when it came out, the next part should already be available on Patreon, but will come to YouTube in a week. If you're watching this in the future, I hope you'll stick around for the next one. Things will get interesting. Until next time.